Welcome everyone and thank you so much for being here at NYU Outlaws annual alumni award ceremony. Thank you especially to our incredible honorees, Justice Lynn Nakamoto and Mr. Robert Raven. I'm Tal, I'm one of Outlaws co-chairs along with Andrea Green. This past semester has been challenging in ways that neither Andrea nor I could have fully anticipated when we decided last spring to apply for these positions. Outlaw's task this year was to build and strengthen a queer community here at the law school, even though many students, including myself, would not be physically on campus to meet one another, share meals, or walk to class side by side. And initially, this task felt impossibly difficult. But I have been so grateful for the way each and every member of our student board has risen to meet the immense challenges of this moment and of everything we have accomplished together so far. We've hosted dozens of virtual events for students, including Zoom scavenger hunts and movie nights, online mentorship mixers, and panels on everything from being a queer corporate litigator to the language that folks at the intersection of LGBTQ and disabled identities use to identify themselves. We've also organized a specific group within Outlaw for students in the transgender, gender non-conforming and intersex communities. Additionally, we've established and funded a new scholarship for incoming NYU law students who are committed to pursuing justice on behalf of transgender women of color. We're here today because of two outlaw alumni who have themselves persevered in the face of difficulty and who have not let the enormity of the work ahead slow them down. We're here today to recognize Justice Nakamoto and Mr. Rabin for their commitment to intersectional leadership. Both have dedicated their careers to amplifying the many voices that make up our incredibly diverse LGBTQ community. We are so grateful to them for joining us today. And with that, I'll hand things over to Dean Morrison. Thanks, Tal, and good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> this uh, annual reception, uh, alumni reception and award evening has become one of my um, favorite events of the law school calendar. Um, and Outlaw has been recognizing uh, alumni each year since 2013, which happens to be the same year that I became Dean here at the law school. I am like all of us, I'm sure are sorry that we can't be gathering in person in the way that we usually do, but I'm very grateful that we can be gathering this way. Um, I wanna thank um, the outlaw leadership for their terrific work in this very difficult year. Um, just as Tal was explaining, um, it's been a challenge for all of us to be operating in this mostly remote mode, but we've really um, been inspired by the leadership of our students and keeping our community close knit and engaged and active on critical issues. And certainly Outlaw is one of the most important student organizations on campus, uh, has been for many years and continues to be. Um, I think you all know that NYU Law is proud of the tradition that we have with respect to uh, the rights of people in the LGBTQ community. In 1978, we were the first law school in the country to, den to deny our career services to employers that discriminated on the basis of sexual orientation, expanding a non-discrimination policy that we already had in place with respect to race, gender, religion, and national origin and disability. Um, and then during the enforcement of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, NYU really led the challenge to the constitutionality of the Solomon Amendment, litigation that of course did not su succeed in the Supreme Court, but it was part of a broader campaign that I think we can at least partially credit for the ultimate uh, repeal of, of, of that policy. Um, of course, we saw a return of it during the last administration or hopeful to see um, things going back in a more encouraging direction um, going forward under, under the new presidential administration. Um, I wanna say that of course that history doesn't cause the school to rest on its laurels when it comes to issues of great concern within the LGBTQ community, which are also issues of concern to the broader NYU law community. Um, and the administration uh, really does greatly value Outlaw's leadership in holding the law school to account uh, in terms of doing our best to hold up to the values 
to hold up the values and live up to the values that we espouse when it comes to equality for everyone within our community. Um, and we at the same time are grateful that Outlaw has uh, found through recognizing these really terrific alumni ways to hold up role models in the profession and in the LGBTQ community um, who are themselves graduates of the law school. And it's terrific this year uh, that Outlaw is uh, honoring Justice Lynn Nakamoto of the class of 1985 and Robert Rabin of the class of 1988. Uh, my thanks to both of them um, for agreeing to accept these awards and for the wonderful examples they provide for all of our students um, in terms of what can be done with an NYU law education. So great thanks to them and to everyone in Outlaw, again, uh, for all of your terrific work. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Tal with best wishes for a great uh, session this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean Morrison. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first honoree, Justice Lynn Nakamoto, class of 1985. Justice Nakamoto currently serves on the Oregon Supreme Court, a position she was appointed to in 2016 by Oregon Governor Kate Brown. Justice Nakamoto is no stranger to breaking down barriers. She is one of just 12 openly LGBTQ state Supreme Court justices, and she was the first Asian American ever to serve on Oregon Supreme Court. Justice Nakamoto started her career here in New York at Bronx Legal Services, where she advocated for low-income clients in civil and administrative cases. She then moved to Oregon and continued her work in legal services there as a staff attorney at Marion Polk Legal Aid. Following this, Justice Nakamoto worked at litigation firm Markowitz Herbold, eventually rising to the position of managing shareholder and remaining at the firm until her appointment to the bench in 2011. Justice Nakamoto also served as the chair of the Oregon State Bar's Affirmative Action Committee, was a founding member of the Oregon Minority Lawyers Association, and sat on the board of Q Center, an LGBTQ community center in Portland. Justice Nakamoto has pre-recorded her remarks, and we are so excited to hear from her now. Good evening, and thank you very much for this recognition. I appreciate the time and effort that goes into an event like this. And so I want to thank Kelly Spencer and the members of Outlaw who made this event possible. The broad theme of my remarks today is intersectional leadership. I'm going to address that theme by telling you a little bit about my path to the bench. Let me begin by telling you a story from my law student days at NYU. For context, I started law school in 1982. I can tell you from my personal experience that being lesbian or gay at that time was not well accepted, including in the Asian American community. This was four years before Bowers versus Hardwick, which we all know was our community's Dred Scott decision. I went to law school thinking that my path was in public interest law and I appreciated NYU's public service orientation. So when it was time for my uh, summer after the one out year, uh, I applied for clerkships at places like Legal Services and um, ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. However, I didn't present my whole self to ALDEF. As Professor Yoshino would say, I was covering. I didn't say that I was a member of uh, what was then known as lesbian and gay law students. Uh, it turns out I received an offer from ALDEF and, and others, including a Legal Services uh, National Resource Center. Although I really wanted to work at ALDEF that summer, I turned down the offer. I thought it would be easier as a lesbian to work for Legal Services than to work with other Asian Americans. Uh, I did learn a lot from my clerkship at the backup center and I love legal services. And, you know, as you know, I began my career in legal services in the South Bronx. But later I became acquainted with a staff attorney from ALDEF. 
um, through my work in Chinatown on a battered women's hotline. And he asked me why I had turned down the clerkship from all deaf during my uh, 1L year. And I was honest with him and I told him, I thought, I just thought it would be easier for everybody if uh, I went with legal services. And he looked at me in surprise and told me it wouldn't have been a problem for me to work at all deaf. And he knew that because he was gay. And that was my turn for surprise. And uh, needless to say, I was disappointed in myself. I hadn't given the folks at Aldef a chance and I lost the opportunity to work on behalf of Asian American communities with one of the national Asian American legal organizations doing great work. And what I wanna convey is that I learned an important lesson from that intersection of these two identities of mine. And that was to give myself a chance and to give other people a chance. And since then I've applied that lesson in, in how I've approached everyday leadership in multiple communities in Oregon. And for me, everyday leadership is not necessarily a positional leadership. By virtue of our training and our law licenses, we have, as lawyers, tremendous skills, power, and privilege. Everyday leadership is the work all of us can and should do to make our corners of the world a better place. I know that everyday leadership, plus a good dose of luck, helped lead to my first appointment to the Oregon Court of Appeals, our intermediate appellate court here and then to my current position on the Oregon Supreme Court. You can exercise leadership in many ways, both outside and within the profession. There's political activism. There are community-based organizations of all stripes. There are advocacy organizations like the ACLU, uh, pro bono work, uh, work on committees and boards raising money for legal services, uh, being active in professional organizations like the state bar or local bars and affinity bars like lesbian and gay law students or lesbian and gay lawyers and practice related bars. I'd also add to that uh, being a member of the judiciary. And looking back, I've been active in all those arenas at one time or another. Sometimes it was because it was going to be fun. So for example, I and, an, and other Japanese Americans joined two young leaders from California who came to Portland and they wanted to develop a group doing taiko, which is traditional Japanese drumming. Uh, that, that was great fun. Um, Sometimes it was because I wanted to improve the professional community I was in. So I helped organize the Oregon Minority Lawyers Association to, to develop a sense of community that really had not gelled yet um, in what was primarily a, a largely white uh, Oregon bar. And other times, uh, it was because difficult times called for leadership and the need was, was right there. And I wanna share an example. Um, my wife and I have been in Oregon since 1987. And right after we moved to Oregon, uh, an anti-gay group uh, was coming to, coming to power. In 1988, they had uh, success in developing a ballot initiative to roll back uh, protections for lesbian and gay folks. And uh, they just continued uh, to rise and uh, were emboldened. And in um, 1991, 1992, that, that era, um, they thought they could 
uh, by voter initiative, uh, amend the Oregon Constitution and insert a homophobic amendment. And among others, uh, a lot of lawyers took leadership roles and volunteered in the effort against Measure 9. Um, there was, you know, an effort to organize in churches, to do rural organizing, to go neighborhood by neighborhood. And um, I and a few other Asian Americans wanted to reach um, the Asian American community. And we wanted to hold a press conference uh, in Portland with this united Asian American front against Measure 9. And I took on uh, reaching out to the Japanese American community. And although I was new in town, I was pretty optimistic uh, that they would support this effort to come out against Measure 9 because of the mass incar incarceration in World War II. And ultimately this plan worked. We had a large press conference and it was the first time anyone could remember that Asian American communities in Oregon had, had joined together on a political issue like that. So your work may take both you and your communities to a better place. And what happened as a result of that measure nine large political effort was um, for the Asian American communities, um, community leaders met to talk about how to unite together to achieve more political influence for our Asian American communities. And Oregon now has a statewide umbrella advocacy organization to better um, influence uh, political choices and to gain power for our communities. Um, also as a result of Measure, measure 9 um, and that fight, the LGBT community organized the statewide umbrella organization. And that was not only to be more organized in defeating this anti-gay group, but also to strategically plan for the future and to advance uh, our legal rights. And for me personally, uh, it was the beginning of my becoming a part of the Asian American community in Portland. And from then um, I volunteered on a number of boards and um, became more integrated in the community. Also during the Measure 9 uh, era, um, I volunteered to take on a pro bono case for a firefighter who was seen at an anti-Measure 9 rally. He was a straight man, but he was getting harassed and um, was suffering adverse employment actions um, because of uh, his being seen at the rally. And that was my first case as a volunteer lawyer for the ACLU of Oregon. And that led to other cases that I handled for the ACLU, primarily on lesbian and gay rights. Um, so later in the 80s, I was called on to prepare an amicus brief, sort of a Brandeis brief in a case called Tanner versus OHSU. Uh, and that case recognized uh, same-sex domestic partnerships and required state government to give employee benefits to uh, domestic partners of state employees. Um, that also led to um, my representing nine same-sex couples as co-counsel with the National ACLU Lesbian and Gay Rights Project in um, 2004, that era when um, California notably and Oregon um, started issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. It turns out that all of that was important in my road to the bench. Um, and it's that everyday leadership and 
even though I had worked for the lesbian gay community, I was active in the Asian American community. Those were, those were actually supportive of um, my effort to become the first Asian American on Oregon's uh, appellate courts. So the, the overall lesson I, I wanna leave you with is to be authentic, um, to create community and finally make your corner of the world a better place. Thank you very much for this wonderful award. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Green, the other co-chair of Outlaw. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our second award recipient, Robert Rabin, and we're delighted to recognize Mr. Rabin for his tireless advocacy within the LGBTQ community. Mr. Rabin is the president and founder of the Rabin Group, drawing from its roots in LGBTQ and racial justice advocacy in its client advising. The Rabin Group proudly walks the walk with a diverse team reflective of the community. The Rabin Group launched an LGBTQ strategies initiative in 2014, centering the work of Mr. Rabin had been doing in the community for more than two decades. Today, the team draw from the same well in the Rabin Group's diversity, equity, and inclusion counseling, consulting. On a personal note, I had the privilege of attending a panel event this summer for Lavender Law, addressing racial equity within the LGBTQ legal community. Robert's lifelong commitment to racial and LGBTQ equity was very inspiring, and that event encouraged me to press on with equity and representation-focused leadership for Outlaw this year. While organizations everywhere aspire to address intersectionality, Mr. Rabin and the Rabin Group are incredible role models. We are so happy to recognize your lifetime of advocacy with this award. Wow, if I had to figure out the unmute and the video. Um, thank you, Attorney Green. Uh, for those incredibly kind words. We need you in the fight. I hope that you, you pick up the baton of public policy uh, and come join us on, on some of the most important things that a lawyer can work on, which is, which is changing the law and making the country a better place for people. Thank you so much to Outlaw uh, Dean Morrison. I really, really appreciate your tremendous leadership and your very kind words and your support of this organization. And Justice Nakamoto, I... Um, very much enjoy and have watched your leadership and your important work on the court from afar. So God bless you for everything you're doing, not just for the people of Oregon, but everywhere. So this is very exciting. Um, I, I'm honored and I talk publicly all the time, but it's very rarely about me. So let's see if I can, I can get through this uh, in a way that's both coherent and smart and a good use of people's time. The Raven Group, uh, which is a firm that I started and have run for 20 years, is a national public affairs group. We uh, work to change the laws through advocacy and lobbying and communications, diversification, et cetera, uh, to shift power to women and people of color. It's an unusual business model in the private sector, but we make it work. We are 70% people of color. We are 95% minority and female. And at 100 people, there's no agency in the nation that has flipped the model. I basically curated a professional work staff of people who have been told in generations prior that we can't, that we can't operate at the highest level. So Rabin is an existential experiment that women and people of color, the visibly disabled, different body types, LGBTQ identified, can come together and do the highest quality work and make change and we do. So if you're interested in Raven, uh, let us know, join us. We'd love to have you. Um, and I'll tell you a humorous story one day about what it was like to be certified as an LGBTQ business when someone from the Gay Chamber of Commerce comes and interviews you and asks you to prove that you're gay, which was a conversation stopper for me. And I won't say more right now. Um, I have enormous respect and love for NYU Law. The three years that I spent there, I was alive. I had come from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania undergraduate, so it wasn't really hard to compete. But 
the notion that one of the most influential and important levers of power in the United States, the law, could be used to make the country better, to, to help the country meet its promise of liberty and freedom and equality was, was energizing and exciting. It became a, a, a connection between my head and my heart. Personally, um, I was what we would now call closeted. Uh, members of my family knew, obviously, people I dated knew and close friends, but I was, I was pretty visibly and completely closeted. I'm sure friends of mine at the time may dispute that. But compared to so many of you who have the courage to, to live who you are as a, at an earlier age, I was not there. And in fairness to me, um, the country was very different. I was born and raised in Miami, which is the epicenter of intersectionality. We will talk about that in a minute. But it was also the place when I was 13 years old for a national campaign led in Miami by Anita Bryant to ban homosexuals, as we were then known, from schools, from public employment, and basically public life. It was also a city, not unlike many others in the country. Uh, I grew up reading a newspaper, the Miami News, in which homosexuals who were arrested for being homosexual, for being in a park, trying to meet each other for the various things that the larger community disapproved of, our names and pictures were published in the Miami News, which was an afternoon newspaper, as a way of shaming us and our families. That's the environment in which I grew up. So those of us who stayed closeted for years, sort of, you know, we had some, we had some fundamentals on that, but I'm very, very grateful um, that in my formative years, particularly at NYU, I was surrounded by people who had some courage and experience um, and were more integrated. The other aspect of my life, and, and I'll, I'll talk very fast because it's sad and horrible, but I was in NYU at the very epicenter of the AIDS HIV epidemic, and we were literally dying in the street. The discrimination uh, against us um, and the fear was such that our bodies would be found in dumpsters near St. Vincent's Hospital. And um, the combination of the societal opprobrium um, and the legitimate fear really did a number on men and women of my generation who may have yearned to live a more free life, but the facts and the surroundings uh, up against us were pretty, pretty intense. The intersectionality piece um, has been fundamental to who I am. We are, we are immigrant stock. As I said, I was born and raised in Miami. We are of Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jewish descent. I'm probably the last generation of Jewish American who didn't consider ourselves white. We were other by law. Um, and that is not true for my children who obviously feel differently. But intersectionality was, a, was an important aspect of my life. The, LG, the gay part, I lacked, as I've just told you. And it wasn't until I had the blessing of going to work in Congress um, that I became more integrated. I worked for one of the two openly gay members of Congress, Barney Frank uh, of Massachusetts. The other was Gary Studs, also of Massachusetts. Ironically, they were of adjoining districts. Out of 435, they were the two openly gay ones, although there were many closeted gay members of Congress. But I worked for Barney at a time when the nation was wrestling with what we then called don't ask, don't tell, which was the question of service for our LGBTQ brethren and sistren um, and others in the military. And I was outed. I was outed as the attorney on this issue. I was, I was the attorney working on this issue for the Democrats and I was outed by a band of LGBT activists who felt that it was important that we have standing, that I was what I was fighting for and that I said it. And of course, nobody likes to be outed, but I've also never met an adult young people who were thrown out of their homes is a different situation. And I was blessed to have parents, one of whom is watching right now, uh, who were, were supportive from the start and increasingly very supportive. And they've just been a, a bulwark for me. I met an adult who was outed who was then sorry about it. And that was true for me. Once I was forced to become more integrated or what we would now call intersectional within my, within my own corpus, there was no turning back. But I want to repeat 
where the country was in 1994-93. The very legislation we were debating was called don't ask, at least colloquially called don't ask, don't tell, which sounds abhorrent right now. But the reason it was called that was because the vast majority of homosexuals, as we were known at the time, regrettably, that's how we lived our lives. We were codifying reality. We were not codifying something aspirational. And I raise it because the number of LGBTQ people who complained to us who were pushing to be able to live in the military as open and free, who told us don't do it. We are comfortable with the status now, which is we don't talk about our homosexuality and we don't want to stir this pot. And when I look back at where we were, it's remarkable. It's remarkable how far we've come thanks to your and people like your fight. But it's also an indication of how the intersectionality that Judge Nakamoto and others talk about as between LGBTQ and other communities has been so difficult because the coming out of the LGBT community was such a, a long process. We have come a long way. I'm gonna talk about two examples that I've seen in my life, my personal and my professional life. And, and one is quite stark and harsh, and the other is beautiful and emotional. And I'll end with that one. But the stark one is an example of very serious public policy around LGBTQ people in which intersectionality was not the bulwark. And that's how the hallowed human rights campaign and others promoted our progress throughout the 90s and early 2000s, as we tried to be service members in the military, as we tried to eliminate the ban on HIV travel, as we tried to eliminate the bans on adoption for LGBTQ people, as we tried to eliminate the criminalization of our very sexual activity, um, which was the case in most of the nation. So the issues were formidable. And the Human Rights Campaign and other successful organizations over-indexed us as white and male and middle and upper middle class. They consciously sold an image of us, of what gay America looked like to the rest of the American public as whiter and more male and wealthier than we were. And they were modeling a power dynamic, which was then real and is still real. There was a strategy, there was a political imperative behind it. Most issues that involve white people and particularly white men advance in this country. Most issues that are seen as for the benefit of women, people of color, the immigrant, are much harder to move forward and that still remains the case. And I'm not saying this of what I want to be, I'm describing a very sad and patriarchal and racist hierarchy that exists. But the human rights campaign successfully, and I say successfully in that they accomplished their goals, rejected intersectionality. Once they accomplished an enormous amount of their political goals, including gay marriage, they are, as you're now seeing, with the historic leadership of an African-American, a black African-American African gay man, was fantastic. HRC has now shifted to focusing on intersectionality and really working within the pantheon of civil rights groups so that we can all be free. But for years they did not and they were successful and that's an indictment of our culture. I'll end as I said on a much more emotional and warm note and it's one of my favorite lessons ever about intersectionality and I learned it early in my career and I've never forgotten it. You'll pardon me because I have to pull up some quotes um, on my device, but the background is the following. It involves, and I'm sorry Justice Nakamoto is not on, maybe she can see it, but it involves one of the most significant Asian American civil rights groups in the nation, the Jap Japanese Americans, um, J-A-C-L, I forget what the C stands for, the last word is League, the Japanese American Citizens League, a historic, civil rights and social organization for Japanese American. And it involves the aforementioned congressman that I said, uh, Barney Frank of the fourth district of Massachusetts. And the setup, which will be clear from the remarks that I'm about to read, is involves Congressman Frank's efforts 
when he was a member of Congress and chair of the relevant committee to help Japanese Americans get reparations from the United States government because of their, what I consider to be unlawful and certainly unfair confinement during World War II. And the question before the Japanese American Citizens League, and remember the year, this is 1994. So for those of you who know your history, this is early in the conversation about gay marriage. Gay marriage is lawful nowhere in the country in 1994, probably nowhere in the world. But the question before the convention of the Japanese American Citizen League is whether to adopt a, a resolution in support of gay marriage. And the board, had voted not to. And there's a debate on the floor of the Japanese American Citizens League about whether to override the board's decision. In other words, it's a debate about whether the Japanese American Citizens League is going to support gay marriage in 1994. Congressman Norman Mineta, a leader in Asian American politics and policy and a member of Congress, stood at the floor of the convention of the Japanese American Citizens League and offered this very brief remark. Salt Lake City, August 6th, 1994. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been many years since I spoke on a resolution pending before the National Convention, but I'm compelled to do so in this case. I believe it would be disastrous if this convention were to repudiate the action of our national board in this, in this matter. I'm sorry, the national board must have supported gay marriage. There are those who have argued that gay rights issues are not Japanese American issues. I cannot think of any more dangerous precedent for this organization to set than to take a position on an issue of principle based solely on how it directly affects Americans of Japanese ancestry. When we fought our decade long battle for redress, we won. We could not have done so if we had stood alone in that fight. Where would we be today if the NAACP, the National Council of La Raza, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force had taken the position that redress was a Japanese American issue and had nothing to do with African American, Hispanic Americans or gay and lesbian Americans. Those organizations and their members joined us because they understood and believed in our argument that a threat to the civil rights of one American is a threat to the civil rights of all Americans. They acted based on that principle and not on a narrow evaluation of how redress affected their own communities. We could not have won without their help. But for all the support we garnered outside the Congress, redress did not begin moving in the Congress until 1987. For years, the Administrative Law Subcommittee in the House of Representatives had been chaired by an enemy of redress. He held hearings, but he stacked the witness list against us. And he made sure that the act died at the end of each Congress. Those roadblocks came tumbling down in 1987 when the leadership of that subcommittee changed and Congressman Barney Frank became its chairman. I remember I re mentioned to my staff that I should go and ask Barney if there was any way to get this redress bill moving. I never had a chance to go to him. He came to me in the opening days of the 100th Congress. He told me that his top priority as chair would be to make the promise of redress a reality. And by the end of the 100th Congress, redress was written into the laws of this country a gay congressman from Massachusetts with only a tiny Asian Pacific American constituency makes redress his top priority. Why? Because he saw our civil rights as an issue of fundamental principle for this country. Our success came from the willingness of countless Americans of all backgrounds to take the same position. How can we as an organization turn around and say that civil rights of other Americans have nothing to do with us? I do not think we can. Our reputation as a national civil rights organization is based more than anything else on our dedication of principle and our resolve to stand by our decisions. Doing what is right is often controversial. Doing what is just is often unpopular. But if we are to remain a viable force in the national civil rights movement, we cannot back away from our commitment simply because the issue is difficult. I urge the National Council to reject this resolution overturning the national board's endorsement of same-sex marriage. Congressman Mineta, Congressman Frank, millions of people before them in the struggle for civil rights, practice intersectionality, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw gave it the name. I am humbled, I am honored to follow in their footsteps. 
I'm so proud of Outlaw and NY, NYU. Um, I look forward to your generation of leadership. I look forward to following you. I look forward to living in a country which continues to fight to meet its promise of liberty and equality. Thank you all so much for this award. Thank you so much, Mr. Raven. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank, special thanks to Justice Lynn Nakamoto and Robert Raven. We would love to take this moment to appreciate the rest of the Outlaw Board who do so much work to create community for LGBTQ law students. Thank you so much for everything you do. Last but not least, a huge thank you to Dean Morrison, Kelly Spencer, and Alumni Relations for your support of Outlaw and this annual event connecting current students with the NYU Law alumni community. Thanks everyone and good night. <laughs>